In terms of my comments today, I'd like to break down my, I guess, my, the structure of my discussion into four particular parts. First is looking at leadership and agenda setting in terms of the context of, you know, what does the G7 mean for Japan, but what does Japan mean for the G7? Second, and importantly, I'd like to talk about selective multilateralism. And you may not like this, but I think selective multilateralism is the direction of that we're moving forward in terms of how we think about global cooperation. Third is the convergences and divergences within the G7, which I think is important to touch upon. And again, Hugo set the foundation for this discussion. And lastly, and I apologize for the interpreters, if not in my notes, um, the Japan-US relationship. And I think it is very critical for us to be always considering the Japan-US relationship and how it engages in, in, in its uh, policies moving forward. In terms of that first area, leadership and agenda setting is a really critical part of the host's role in terms of the G7. And that is a platform for agenda setting at the domestic, regional, and international level. The G7 provides the host country the opportunity to highlight themes it feels important for fellow GC, uh, G7 members to be thinking about. Um, and with Prime Minister Kishida Fumio at the head of this year's summit in Hiroshima, of course, um, his identity, uh, where he comes from, and uh, Hiroshima's experience as being the first city that were experienced uh, the atomic bomb will be uh, at the centerpiece of his agenda. Again, highlighting the dangers of weapons of mass destruction, uh, proliferation by North Korea, but also thinking about the broader trend in the international community with great powers really issu uh, issuing or giving up the idea of denuclearization and expanding their, their nuclear weapons as a means of defense. In particular, I'm thinking here, of course, Russia just this past week, uh, Mr. Putin talked about placing tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus as a response to what he understands as uh, NATO, um, uh, NATO expansion and uh, a war against Russia. Uh, but we also have China committing to the expansion of of 1,500 nuclear missiles uh, in China by 2035. Um, this is significant. And I, of course, the context here is deterrence of the United States, but for uh, countries like Japan at the, at the leading edge of, I think, the most dynamic and perhaps the most dangerous part of the world, they're looking at these dynamics very seriously. Um, I would be remiss not to add that discussions in South Korea are, are also moving towards the acquisition of uh, nuclear deterrent against North Korea. These have serious repercussions for how Japan is thinking about security. And this is why I think uh, denuclearization uh, and weapons of mass destruction are really uh, a centerpiece of the agenda of this year's um, G7. But we should put this in the context of the layered discussion that I mentioned in terms of domestic, regional, and international dynamics. And importantly, I think we should be thinking about how Japan has been quite consistent in terms of denuclearization whether it's the 2022 June Shangri-La Dialogue where Prime Minister Kishida in his vision for peace spoke specifically about a commitment towards denuclearization or most, most recently the release of the new national security strategy stresses that Japan is not moving away from its three non-nuclear principles. Again, the G7 role promoting denuclearization really is not just for the G7, it's part of a longer term strategy that I think Japan continues to be uh, vested in. I would like to also add that I think Japan is also very much interested in shaping other dynamics. And again, if we look at the guest list on the G7 level, and we didn't mention this this morning, expansion of the G7, but where does South Korea play uh, in this G7? What about Australia? And what about India? Um, these are important economies. Uh, India, of course, will be uh, most likely the fourth largest economy or the third largest economy within the next decade. South Korea plays an important part in supply chains, but also, as we saw with the Yoon Kishida summit just last week, that these countries with proper synergy have a huge amount of ability to provide public goods, either bilaterally, trilaterally within the US, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea context, or potentially as part of the, the uh, United Nations. And here again, I think, uh, Japan advocating for them coming to the summit really plays an important role in thinking about where is the direction of the G7, where are the key players that Japan should be focused, or Japan and the G7 countries should be focusing on.
I would be again remiss not to uh, focus on the Pacific Islands. And you probably noticed in the invitation list, we have some Pacific Island countries that are also being welcomed to the G7. And this reflects, I think, Japan's uh, underlying uh, assumptions of the region that we need to bring in other stakeholders into the G7 to help shape its agenda. And this agenda, of course, is environmental and, and dealing uh, environmental issues and de dealing with environmental uh, climate change, dealing with resilience issues, which has become much more pronounced in the COVID-19 pandemic, but also, again, as our keynote speech mentioned this morning, talking about how uh, the invasion of Ukraine has affected supply chains, food security, and other uh, supply chains. And again, uh, economic uh, security is a key, a key part of that. Now, let me drift towards this idea of selective multilateralism. And I think that this is really a really important theme that the G7 is going to have to address. There is increasing tension between multilateralism as exemplified by the G7, uh, the G20, ASEAN, and even the EU, um, as certain countries are proactively trying to weaken these international institutions and have a track record of fracturing their cooperation. Um, and as a result, we're seeing mini lateral cooperation emerge, whether it's the Quad, whether it's AUKUS, or whether it's trade agreements that are very focused, such as the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. Clearly, multilateral cooperation is important to deal with climate change, denuclearization, uh, uh, dealing with the post-pandemic uh, recovery of the, of the global economy. But at the same time, we need to be realistic about the challenges for uh, large-scale multilateralism and how they can be negatively affected by states that clearly have an interest in weakening rule of law, weakening international institutions, and sometimes, as they say, democratizing the international system. Uh, and this raises very serious questions of what is the direction of the G7? Who do they bring into the G7 in terms of cooperation? And how do they uh, think about uh, multilateral versus minilateral cooperation? I would like to add that the G7 is really interesting um, because I think that it's a venue to provide cover for countries like Japan as they're trying to deliver very strong messages to regional disruptors. By way of example, I think that the national security law in Hong Kong is a very good example. Japan used the cover of the G7 to have a joint communique which criticized the national security law. And we've seen similar trends uh, with regards to the uh, military exercises around Taiwan in August 2023, but also the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the arbitrary attention, uh, detention of um, Canadians uh, following the arrest of the Huawei executive. The G7 does provide a very useful uh, tool for Japan to express itself without directly expressing its criticisms to uh, particular states. And I think this will continue to be a useful tool. Um, and this is not a, a particularly Japanese uh, phenomenon, but I think it's an interesting aspect of how the G7 is instrumentalized by Japan. In terms of convergences, I, I think broadly at the security and, and uh, security and economic level, uh, there's a lot of convergences in how um, Japan and the G other G7 countries are think seeing international challenges. As evidence, we look at the EU, Canada, Germany, uh, as well as other states have adopted Indo-Pacific strategies or guidelines or visions. And each of these really interestingly talk about a rules-based order. They talked about the importance of economic resilience. They talk about environmental change, and they talk about trying to ensure that uh, rules-based processes, how we negotiate trade, how we negotiate uh, international disputes and how we manage the maritime domain. And again, this suggests that Japan's role and Japan has been on the forefront of preaching these uh, um, areas at least for 10 years, if not longer, um, shows that Japan has had a role in, I guess, educating other G7s as to uh, members as to the importance of these particular issues. Um, again, broad convergence on the areas of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, and again, this implications for a rules-based order moving forward. This theme is permeating the G7 members as authoritarian states continue to try and rewrite the software of the international rules-based order. And I think that's an important take home for us to be thinking about um, how do we manage states that are trying to rewrite the international system 
And is the G7 an effective tool to be able to um, ensure that that software remains the same or it's updated in a way that reflects our interests? Um, notwithstanding the con convergences, I think, that exist on security and economic issues, um, I think that we should be realistic that there are divergences on important areas that may not have macro consequences, um, but here I'm talking about cultural issues, human rights issues, rule of law issues. And again, Madeleine's presentation this morning talked about um, how well different states have managed in terms of their uh, promises. And this comes out in their behavior and policy choices and budgets. Here, I think there is a divergence in terms of where Japan is sitting on cultural issues, some hum human right issues, and some rule of law issues. And this is an area that I think um, more work needs to be done in terms of convergences. Lastly is the United States. And yes, the United States is a critical country for this country's future, but I would argue all the other G7 countries' future. And as we, as we saw under the uh, previous president of the United States, we had challenges in terms of being on the same page of the book about many different issues. The reality moving forward uh, in the 2024 uh, elections is that we may have another disruptor in the White House, or we may not. How do G7 countries manage uh, the United States moving forward is a very important question. Do we continue to find, find uh, do we continue to find crosswalks of cooperation where the United States can take a leadership position in a way that meets our interests? Or do we act as a collective bloc to try and influence, lobby, and push it in a different direction? Of course, this will depend on who is in the White House in 2024, but the, G, uh, the G7 members, including Japan, have an important role in trying to ensure that uh, the United States makes choices that are not only in the interests of the United States, but in interests of the G7 members. We saw Japan played a special role uh, during the Trump administration in trying to push back against some of the uh, less, uh, less orthodox approaches by the United States to manage challenges. But I think that we need to be very conscious that Japan needs to work with the other G7 members, again, to ensure that the G7 functions in areas uh, and ways that uh, benefit its members, benefit the global community, not just by influencing the United States, but by bringing in other stakeholders such as South Korea, India, Australia, and Pacific Island members. Thank you.